So I'm uh, Naranjan Ine. Uh, I've been programming for the past 20-22 uh, years and uh, just continue to do, enjoy programming a lot. Uh, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about JavaScript in the context of you know, the overall ecosystem, uh, characteristics about it that I find interesting and uh, a little bit about you know specific characteristics of the Java language in terms of details. So we'll be looking at a little bit of code as well. So it's kind of a little bit of code and a little bit of context setting. I think I'm going to find this. Yeah. <laughs> so I have those slides today. Uh, just a card deck. Uh, so how many here think JavaScript is a very clean language? How many think it's a wonderful language? Okay. And and, and, and do you see the, the paradox in there? You know. Just you know, Java, JavaScript is a terribly interesting language, that's for sure. Yeah, you know. Uh, there's very little things about that you can say about JavaScript, uh, JavaScript, you know, that are centrist views. You typically end up being at extreme. Either it's good or it's bad, or it's wonderful, or it's not so good, or it's you know, oh, oh. but you know, it, it you know elicits real reactions. Uh, what I'm going to try to do is try to mute some of those reactions of mine. I'm not going to try to go overboard in terms of pro JavaScript or. Uh, you know, the other direction in terms of being anti JavaScript, but really try to take a look at the language uh, without really bringing in too many biases or too many extremities into the picture. <laughs> Having said that, I am not really a JavaScript programmer myself. Uh, in the sense, today I don't code a whole bunch of JavaScript except an occasional web page. So you might find, you know, occasional uh, issues in the code or stuff like that. Please excuse me. Uh, it, this is not the language I use day in day out for uh, my work. Um, but just a little bit of uh, uh, you know history of JavaScript. Uh, what happened was in 19 was it 95? Uh, Brendan Eich was asked to create a complement to Java for the Netscape browser. Now Java was a full blown language. Uh, pretty much everybody wanted to imagine or did imagine that Java will be the language for the browser. Uh, history went in a completely different direction. Uh, but they needed something to kind of glue together the Java and, uh, and, and maybe a little bit of the DOM elements. Uh, Brent and I created it in, wrote the first version in 10 days flat. I think he talked about, you know, there being a specification, not being a specification. I mean, writing a new language in 10 days flat, I mean, you have an idea of the amount of rigorous thought that would have gone into it. I mean, I'm sure all he was probably struggling was with was the deadline. And uh, it was initially called LiveScript, uh, but then they decided it's not such a nice name. And uh, Netscape got a waiver from Sun for the use of the trademark Java and, you know, essentially ended up calling it uh, JavaScript. I'm told Gosling wasn't too happy with that decision. Incidentally, the trademark is owned by Record now. Sorry? The JavaScript trademark is owned by Record. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, anyway. So that's a bit of a history of you know essentially what happened with uh, JavaScript. But the vision then was the browser would be owned by Java. I mean, there, there is HTML, then there is JavaScript for the glue kind of stuff, and you know Java applets were imagined to be the thing where you know um, you would have Java on the client and something else on the server, um, and Java applets being mobile. Uh, Way things turned out that didn't quite play out that way, but JavaScript stuck, and it soon started getting used in other contexts, and it started really getting uh, competition in the context that it was already entrenched in. Uh, I worked with uh, something called LiveWire in 1996, and that was the second web app I created, and uh, that was a server-side JavaScript. Uh, I wrote it in my, I think 1996. Uh, on Netscape Enterprise Server, and it was today what you can do in you know Ruby or PHP or uh, Python. In 1996, I wrote the app, uh, which was very very well received for the internal. It was our internal bug tracking system, 
and people are just amazed. I mean, the fact that we suddenly moved from a static browser, uh, static HTML, into a dynamic environment where you know the browser could actually interact with backend databases. And uh, what played a role, big role there was JavaScript because the entire server side infrastructure was JavaScript. Uh, it, I don't know how many of you would know about it, but it was an environment called LimeWire. It was a part of Netscape Enterprise Server, and you could write server side applications back then. Node.js came in way, way, way much later. Unfortunately, LimeWire didn't really catch on much. And uh, in the meanwhile, JavaScript started getting competition on the client thanks to something called DBScript. Again, a quick attempt to, uh, you know, let's get something out to start competing with JavaScript. That didn't do too well. So, DBScript didn't do, didn't do too well. Java, which was supposed to be really, you know, enjoying that space, didn't really occupy the client space that well. What we were left with was JavaScript was essentially a monopoly. And it's been that way since. And that's something that's really helped JavaScript uh, all along the way. Uh, there have been times that, that have been really good for JavaScript and there have been times which have been not so good. Uh, in the times that have been not so good, the fact that it had an absolute monopoly on that particular environment helped it stay alive and helped it, you know, kind of bounce back. I mean, if cat has nine lives, I have counted JavaScript for at least three lives so far. So, let's see how many more it gets. Okay. So, one of the things I, at that particular point in time, I really got into, and this was 96, was I being a big OO fan then, I still am actually, um, really wanted to explore what JavaScript the script could do in terms of object orientation and my I was in for a big discovery case I mean this was completely surprising I mean my you know I was completely knocked off the by the level of uh, the kind of O. I had never looked at a prototype based uh, language before I didn't even know quite frankly what it meant so I was just looking at the if, if implications of what it meant and really played around with it and all you could realize was that coming from a C++ world then and suddenly into this environment that you could practically do anything. You could rewrite an object's in, you know, hierarchy on the fly, on the run, you could add attributes to it on the fly, you can add an attribute to an object, you could add an attribute to the class, you could uh, change the inheritance hierarchy, um, you could pretty much do anything you wanted with any part of that RAM, you know, memory space uh, and you were the boss, I mean, you could do whatever you wanted in that. And there was an amazing learning about JavaScript. I don't know how many people actually know about the amount of rewriting uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I, beta programming is not necessarily the right word, but the amount of dynamic reorganization you can do of the internal memory, uh, not memory, the variables and the structures in JavaScript, it's incredible. And, you know, when I, st I started learning that, and I was really amazed. We built some good client-side applications, we actually built a model view controller on the client-side using JavaScript. And what really helped there at that particular point in time was the fact that once I kind of threaded through, what, you know, the way the OO was structured, I could get amazing capabilities uh, by writing relatively small amounts of code. So just a little bit of, uh, you know, what what kind of OO exists in Java, uh, JavaScript, sorry. Okay. So I could have something like this. Is this visible? Big enough for everybody? So, let's say I have this function person and oops, sorry, learning too many languages. So, what's this? What did I do here? P for P is a, a person is a function and I just ran that function. There's nothing there in that. This is, so it didn't return me anything. But I you know I could just do this. And what did I do here? I created an object of the type of, you know type version. Isn't it mind blowing? I don't have the word called class. <laughs> I mean, there is no, you know, this is all that was really required to create an object. It, it, it is simultaneously an object and it is a function. 
So I can now start, you know, doing uh, stuff with this. I can say function person. I can give it a name. Okay. And I will do this and I'll say any. Oops. How do I get this here? How do I make it an attribute of that particular? Right, and I can create an attribute dynamically. Does it have any method yet? No. I can try to look at some other arbitrary attributes which are which don't exist. P dot two doesn't exist. P dot two equals bar. Here I was I am able to add an attribute to the object on the fly, uh, and then essentially what I can do is uh, P dot greet equals function. So now I can say p dot read and print out hello. And I could instead now also say so you, you see this is an exceptionally malleable language. I mean you could you can you can take it like a clay and you know mold things together pretty much the way you want it. There is no compiler wanting to stop you. There are no runtime constraints stop, you know, trying to stop you. There are no, uh, as, I mean, it's simply a substantially constrained free environment. I can keep on going this, doing this again. I can do, I'll, I'll, I'll do a little bit about inheritance, but the, what I really wanted to talk about here was, this is a really constrained free environment, which is the other language where you could, you could do this kind of stuff. Today, I think a lot of this can be done. Um, in Python, in Ruby, but there's still more stuff that cannot be done that I can talk about, and which is where we get into prototypes and stuff like that. In Python and Ruby, can't easily do. JavaScript, to me, amongst all the languages that I have worked with, is the most constraint-free of all, which also makes it the most unsafest of all. So decide it, you know, which way you want to take it, but the fact is, you can't ignore it because it occupies one extreme space in terms of the kind of programmatic paradigm, not paradigm. Uh, environment it presents you. It gives you a constraint free environment. It makes you the you know master of the world and say now you do what you want, I trust you and you know it's up to you. And that's a very 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 defining characteristic of JavaScript. In some shape it's probably helped because it meant people could learn JavaScript or start using JavaScript very very rapidly. I think uh, I can't uh, I don't remember the exact quote but I think Douglas uh, Crockford Dr. Scott uh, once said, JavaScript is one of those languages where people don't think they need to know the language before they start coding. <laughs> there are actually two languages like that. Uh, anybody wants to take a guess, just feel free. But, you know, people can get in, jump in and start writing code. And that's a part of, you know, what made JavaScript successful. Like it, not like it, it made JavaScript successful because it got people in very, very quickly. You know. So you might be an HTML programmer, you might be actually a graphic designer who is doing Photoshop PhDs. But you could still write a little bit of JavaScript without really knowing a lot about programming. So anyway, we'll just, you know, go on with this a little bit more. And I'm going to say now, P2 equals new version N2, let's say, I'll just use the name. Right. And if I try to do this, it won't work because I had added the method on the object instance and I did not object the, add the method on the class. But I never declared the class. So where do I add it? It's fairly straightforward to add it. You basically say person dot prototype dot greet. 
equals function and console dot log. Okay. Uh, namaste. Yes. Yes. Name. Right. Now I can go back and try to read on that p two dot read. What happened here? I already instantiated the object p two. Later on, I changed the class, but it inherited it. How did that work? Because essentially, what JavaScript does is it maintains a set of internal pointers, me to my prototype, my prototype to its prototype, and, and so on and so forth. If you can add stuff anywhere you want along the way, and that certainly becomes dynamically visible. Uh, you can change the function to do certain, you know, something completely different. Uh, you could change a function which saves the world into you know launching a nuke missile. It, it, it's not going to stop you. It doesn't make judgments about what you are allowed to do or not allowed to do. Uh, there's more stuff here I can you know talk about in terms of how the inheritance works uh, and how the inheritance you know, prototypes and constructors and everything else. Um, let me go to the talk later on. Maybe we can talk about it a little bit. But so this is just a, gives you a flavor for what is the nature of object orientation of JavaScript and the amount of freedom it gives you. It really gives you a tremendous amount of freedom. Uh, and its OO is very, very unique in terms of being a very prototype based object orientation. There is no class structure. So JavaScript was popular. It was popular as in it was popular for the HTML script kiddies. And people were using it. Uh, this was the days when you know you had the blink tags you know running all over the place uh, and it was competing with VBScript and it was competing with Java, Java lost very quickly, VBScript took some time but over a period of time you know VBScript was also on its way out and JavaScript was very very boring I mean, there is there's no mention of JavaScript per se I mean why would you want to really talk about that language no, no industry articles nothing about that and you know, people were talking about you know browser being the next OS. And you know what was the big constraint then? JavaScript and HTML just couldn't handle it. I mean, they just didn't have the capabilities of being the next OS. It just wasn't there. For better or for worse, you know, Microsoft one day introduced something called XML HTTP request. <laughs> yeah, if JavaScript needed a gift. This was one that was delivered to it right away, bang, you know, at its speed, the sweet spot. Suddenly, Ajax became fashionable, and because Ajax became fashionable, and you had a monopoly here on the browser, JavaScript had a pretty much dominant monopoly. You know, nobody else could really come there. So then, JavaScript had, you know, you had to find ways to make JavaScript really leverage Ajax. Everybody wanted rich clients, right? I mean, they still want it, and they still are not happy about it. So, for the last 15 years, people have been unhappy about the level of rich client support. Uh, they still are, nothing has changed. But at least JavaScript is much, much more capable today in terms of, in combination with HTML and uh, CSS uh, than it was then. I mean, today you really can talk about you know, a lot of rich clients. But another spoil sport was there. You had different browsers, essentially two. Um, and. Uh, <laughs> You know, they, they couldn't agree on each other, with each other in terms of uh, exactly how JavaScript should, should be here. Uh, even for the same browser, sometimes the versions couldn't agree. Yeah. And uh, you know, you had really people, when, when you said at that point in time in history, when you talked about JavaScript and said, you know, JavaScript, everybody would just say browser issues. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we had this you know line which still continues today in, in many websites. This site optimized for Internet Explorer. <laughs> what it meant was my site cannot support Netscape and or and or Firefox in terms of its requirements for JavaScript. I wrote my JavaScript only for IE. I tested only for IE. And, you know, live with it. <laughs> because the developer couldn't spend so much time, you know, trying to you know debug all this stuff. But eventually, people wanted it. Uh, you know, consumers got more powerful. Uh, end consumers as opposed to just enterprise consumers and they started you know I want to use Netscape, I want to use Safari, I want to use whatever and browser incompatibility became an issue that's where other libraries started stepping in you had I remember something called Dojo which was pretty hot then 
and eventually something came became much harder work called jQuery. They handled the JavaScript uh, browser incompatibilities uh, kind of very nicely. jQuery along the way actually introduced some very very nice uh, uh, ways to structure your code in terms. Of, it, it's got very functional structures, the constructs. But it, it did that, that quite nicely in terms of its selectors and in terms of how to manipulate the DOM objects. I mean, the DOM was uh, not exactly the most amenable and the easiest to use construct, but jQuery kind of, you know, took away all the rough edges. And, uh, you know, it really helped in terms of making sure uh, people could use JavaScript and build reasonable, uh, reasonably rich Ajax applications on top of JavaScript that would run on top of all browsers. JavaScript was again popular for a while and essentially people didn't really mention JavaScript. All you saw in uh, blog posts and web page and uh, articles then was Ajax. So Ajax, RCP uh, and JavaScript was essentially the Lingua factor for doing that. In the meanwhile, now JavaScript is with a you know, standard body mm -hmm. called ECMA. Uh, people debate a lot about uh, you know, what should be in JavaScript standard, what should not be in JavaScript standard. One of the things that's happening is now JavaScript, suddenly people are realizing, oops, JavaScript is no longer just a browser client environment. It's a full-blown language. It needs, it should, you know, capabilities uh, that should be there in full-blown languages. And, and you're seeing more and more of those kind of getting introduced. But uh, just to kind of give an example, here's there's some stuff from, this is, I, I just gave a talk on functional programming. And this is a, another piece of code which you know kind of talks about the functional programming characteristics of Java. Amongst FP languages, it's not great, but it's still it's starting to have those capabilities in terms of uh, here I can you know talk about map, reduce, filter, uh, every some these are very very essentially functional constructs which are there as a part of JavaScript. Just as an example, I I, I kind of you know created a set of objects there called items and you, your task is like this okay you have to run through this list uh, here on the right uh, let me show you this these are your records in the table and your status shipped and pending what you need to do and write the code for is to say pick up all the items which are status in shipped state Okay, uh, multiply the rate by their quantity because these are in, in essentially invoice items. You want to create an invoice out of it. Uh, based on the tax code, apply a particular tax rate, which I have you know shown here. Okay, and then compute the total invoice amount for me. Now there is various different ways I could write this code, <coughs> and uh, which how how would you write this code? You probably have for loops, one for loop for all this, then there's a if condition for checking the status equal to pending or ship. But then after that, you would have a reason to go get the tax rate. Then you would, in the next line, compute and add everything together, compute the total amount for that item. Then you would have another for loop, sorry, then you would have a counter, which you would start off with zero and keep on adding values to it, some summation accumulator, counter is not the right, right word, accumulator and in the end you would come out of that for loop and take the value of the accumulator and print it and say this is uh, the value of the invoice. Turns out there is another way to write it, <coughs> which is this three lines. I don't know how many, maybe many of you do write it that way, maybe many of you don't write it that way, but JavaScript can allow you to write it that way. I don't know how many knew that. JavaScript has got enormous amount of functional features. Uh, some of them in the standard, some of them in the upcoming standard. Uh, there are a lot of them which are not actually there in the uh, standard version, so you won't get them on Node, but you will get them on uh, the Firefox version. Uh, many, many, many more functional kind of stuff. But they will eventually be there. And you, this is exactly the code I talked about. Uh, what it? Let me explain to you what it does. It takes this list of items, it says I want to filter it using a callback function which says, uh, callback is a wrong word, using a function which says is status shift. After that I want to map it with another function to say uh, get me the total amount 
for that particular line item. How much I have, I have to charge the customer. Once I get that, and this is all chaining. If you see the dots here, I, you know, call reduce to take that, um, you know, all these amounts and hold them into one single value. Okay. Uh, I mean, just a quick question. Uh, if you were to write this this code, how many of you would have preferred this kind of an approach today? Wonderful. I, then I'm I'm very pleasantly uh, You know, uh, I would say surprised, but I'm also quite happy that you know. People are really using that, but, but JavaScript is adding more and more of these capabilities. And this so filter is a built-in uh, method on arrays. Yes, there's a whole bunch of other stuff mm -hmm. that is not there. And, and 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 by the way, I can't understand exactly which version has it and which version doesn't have it. This works on the node version, the current node version. It's easy to add shims for all of this stuff because Sorry? it is called multiple prototype, right? Hey, no, no, that is a uh, uh, no, no, but uh, otherwise. There are a lot of other things, like for example, uh, iterators and generators, which you can't just bolt on. They are coming in, um, you know, future versions. I think the Netscape versions have it, uh, have them. The Node version doesn't have them. Uh, how, how many of you are aware of the yield? Yield, Y I E L D. But in Python, not in JavaScript. Okay, Python. Okay, JavaScript in the standard, I think, is expected to get a yield, which will be essentially a generator. How many know you can send in a value? to a JavaScript generator using yield. You could actually do that. And that's also, again, uh, this version doesn't have this stuff. I was writing this code yesterday, it, it won't run because the current node version doesn't have that stuff. But I'm told it's all on the way. So anyway, there's a, there's a bunch of capabilities. I had them noted somewhere, I, I need to look it up. Uh, other capabilities also that JavaScript is getting. So while it has a lot of capabilities, I think as a full-blown first-class you know, language, I think it's getting many, many more. And they are all kind of on their way, which is which makes it a dynamic and growing um, environment for a language. <coughs> any any questions so far? How are we doing on time? Sorry, one second. Have we fifteen minutes more? Okay. okay. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, this this approach looks like same as Erlang, I think. Erlang and Prolog, Prolog kind of thing that. You create a database and then you query on that database. I think Prolog has this kind of database and Erlang, I think, has the same that kind of functionality that provides a user functional language. I think it has a similarity to Erlang in terms of the fact that these are essentially functional constructs. Yeah. You will find map, filter, and reduce and or fold, fold or fold L in almost all the languages which support some kind of functional <laughs> programming constructs. Uh, this is not like Erlang. Uh, not like Prolog. Prolog is something very different. It does backward chaining. It does. Uh, let's not get there. This is not Prolog. Uh, definitely not. No way close to it. Sincerely, jQuery does backward chaining. Sorry? jQuery does backward okay, chaining. Okay, I didn't know that. So you can go up the chain from here, down, uh, down the chain. Backward chaining of logic? No, in the sense that. Um, no, he's talking about DOM elements. DOM elements. DOM elements. No, no. Yeah. Prolog does backward chaining of logic. Logic. Backward okay. chaining of logic. Thanks, <laughs> sir. So uh, it actually works your logic backwards to kind of find out you know what should be the incoming values. Oh. Uh, log is a completely different ballgame. I know, and get mixed up with some database stuff. Then I get mixed up with. I think that's called Erlang. I think that's also Erlang. No, no, no. This map filter reduce is is, is lingua franca for functional languages. Yep, yep. Doesn't matter whether it's Erlang. Scala, Haskell, uh, I got, uh, they're all the same. Mr. Bush says that uh, there's a database and then you do something on that database that you've created in first place. So that I think that was kind of philosophy of same uh, prologue way that fifth generation language that you have a database created before and then use that database to extract the queries. Okay. What I meant by database was I'm, I was representing this here in this structure. What I meant was this. Assume that these were records coming off of a database. That's all. Hey, so JavaScript was interesting again. Thanks to RCP and thanks to Ajax, and then it again became boring. Uh, you know, not much was happening. And one fine morning, node happened. And frankly, everybody got excited. And frankly, I haven't quite figured out, you know, completely, you know, how that correlates. I mean, why did node make such a big difference? I haven't figured it out. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure there are good reasons. I, I'm not questioning that. Uh, 
But what was what was Node really at the end of the day? It, it provided an excellent positioning for JavaScript, which separated it from all these other wannabe script kiddies, which who were trying to build uh, essentially PHP or Rails or Python applications to say, I can build highly concurrent applications for you, whatever that meant. <laughs> okay. The point is, you know, the highly concurrent threshold at which this kind of stuff makes a difference is so high. Ninety-five percent of us won't ever need it. Uh, it's it's really really high. I mean, normal languages can go to reasonable levels of concurrency without really having to try to do implement uh, you know reactor patterns and uh, event loops and all that kind of stuff. Uh, they are really important. Uh, they are really useful by high concurrency. No two uh, thoughts about that. But they get required at a reasonably high level, much 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 further down the road. <coughs> But JavaScript was back on the server side again, and that's what I like because I always related the fact that Livewire never quite made it. To me, if Livewire had made it, I would have never gone to Ruby back. Ruby Python and PHP perhaps wouldn't have made it. Livewire would have kind of dominated the scene for some reason, which is essentially you know all about enterprise politics. Livewire really didn't do it. But JavaScript was server side again, and that was exciting because JavaScript no longer was. A monopoly in one area, but then a non-competing uh, party in another. It actually could compete with other languages in the server side, and Node gave it a, gave it a leg up, um, you know, to be able to do that. Just some I think there's uh, one other significant event that uh, shaped JavaScript's evolution, Wait. which is the introduction of Gmail and Google Maps. Yeah, until until then, you know, XML, XML HTTP request was seen as a way of refreshing little parts of the page. But what Gmail and Google Maps did is they introduced the idea that you could have a client side app in the browser. Those two were the first ones to introduce the concept, and then of course Chrome made it possible with V8, which was a super fast engine. Right. right. I have, uh, I have a solution about why Node got famous or or why JavaScript got that much server side. And, and the reason of why the node is here is because JavaScript is so ugly that it cannot provide recent input-output operation, no stoppage of input-output operations. So anything could, no, no restrictions on any input-output output, output so that anything could do get as asynchronous in that sense. So ugliness of the JavaScript provides the way to, to do asynchronous programming. In the same page. Example here is a Ruby. It's very clean language, and it pro do not provide the input output. It provides uh, restricted input output in that sense. JavaScript has a very short. You know, uh, the I think Douglas Crookford uh, said about this. Uh, you use about Douglas Crookford lectures. There was second lecture talk where he used the same words where you were I think referring previously. Second lecture I think that was okay. in second lecture. So uh, the main reason is ugliness of JavaScript that provide Node.js to be built on that. I have taken the talk, some talks of uh, the uh, Node.js maker. I think the you know, there's a guy who was a script. Sorry, what was that? There's a guy sitting behind showing his fist. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, so uh, fair enough. Uh, you talk about JavaScript being ugly uh, for whatever. It's, it's got an exceptionally low learning curve. And that's a characteristic of JavaScript that actually makes it beautiful in many, many ways. But yes, I, I forget where I picked this up. I think it was from Netcraft or something like that. This is a, probably a week old image. And I didn't, unfortunately, I must confess, I've been just so tied down with so much stuff. I didn't get actually uh, time to do the research on this image in detail. But this, was, this struck me. Uh, let me tell you what uh, the axes are here. Uh, the x axis. Left hand side is used by fewer sites, right hand side is used by many sites. And uh, the y axis <laughs> lower, lower down is used by low traffic sites. And uh, uh, higher, the, you know, the, as you go up, it's used by higher traffic sites. I don't know, quite frankly, the methodology of this, uh, how, the, how they got this uh, data in the first place. Uh, so, treat this as a completely for what it's worth. But it's interesting to see where the position node.js uh, you know, really occupies. Used by high traffic sites. 
I don't know how many hydrophy sites are out there in using glue. And the networks must have studied and done some kind of research to kind of reach that. I don't know that methodology, unfortunately. Uh, but it's interesting that, you know, that's where Node.js find itself. It's not surprising, but, you know, if I had to guess, I wouldn't have imagined that. Um, GitHub and Stack Overflow questions. Sorry? It's picked up from GitHub and Stack Overflow questions. This it. one? Yeah. Okay. So the interest in GitHub and Stack Overflow is what decided where the individual language should be brought up. No, that was a different one. That was a Redmond survey, right? Oh yeah, sorry, sorry. That, this is Netcraft, Netcraft. Netcraft. Sorry, Netcraft. Sorry, Netcraft. Sorry, Netcraft. actual yeah. website uh, uh, measurement. Can you, can you zoom in a little bit into that? Sure. Just one bit. Yeah, I actually have the Red Monk image in the subsequent year. But anyway, so let's uh, conclude. So it's just an interesting position. Uh, there's another image I had here. Why is it not showing up? And you know, this is the growth of Node.js website. Healthy growth, but if you look at the x-axis numbers, uh, you know, it, it kind of puts it in perspective. 0 0.005, 0 0.007. It still has a long, long, long potential growth. You know, but it's going. So that's the note for you. I mean, you know, Node was. Node took off, Node excited people, Node got, you know, people really talking about it, all the cool, uh, suddenly, you know, I, I started noticing some degree of uh, cultural similarities between Ruby and uh, JavaScript. Uh, and you, you essentially had all, a lot of the cool, the coolness factor to it. Uh, Ruby as, in, as of 10 years ago and JavaScript as of 2 years ago or 1 year ago. But anyway, and uh, the next other thing that really started was happening was uh, now people started talking of unifying client and server programming where you know you write a piece of code you shouldn't have to worry about uh, you know where it's getting executed i might you know put a run a sql query from the client and it will actually you know move it back to the server and run it on the server frankly i'm i'm, I'm you know i've come from the dce encina Corba. Uh, Decom days. Uh, I am very suspect when you know something like that people start talking about. I'll I'll keep my fingers crossed. Uh, it's it's a terribly terribly hard thing to pull off. Uh, let you know when you try to abstract away the network, it's really hard. But at least JavaScript has gone far far further than anybody has gone. Um, you know in the past. Uh, I was at PyCon India last uh, week and uh, I think uh, uh, Jacob uh, Moss basically. He was the writer of Django and he talked about Meteor being an example app, which is, you know, an example of the kind apps will be going forward. And Meteor is a Node.js based framework um, and it does rich interactions and, you know, allows uh, one to write code of both client and server. So, I mean, that, that's one area where again JavaScript might show, and the JavaScript ecosystem might show some kind of leadership. So, I can wrap it up in two minutes or I can wrap it up in ten minutes. Sorry, you can do the ten minute version. Sorry? No, actually, no, sorry. Uh, I, I, I thought we were still waiting. I didn't realize. <coughs> My apologies. So, anyway, where is, where, where is JavaScript heading? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a Tolkien fan. And one, unfortunately, you know, the, the word kind of comes to my mind, the, the wondering to bring them all and in, uh, in darkness bind them. I sometimes fear that JavaScript might actually be successful at that. I fear it for a different set of reasons. I am a polyglot. I love different poly, you know, uh, programming languages. I love them all, you know, love to work with number of them. This single language on client and server and that's all I need to do scares me. <laughs> And that too. Oh, by the way, here's an interesting thing for you to kind of uh, uh, do. On Google, search for two mandatory words. Uh, so, for example, the first within double quotes say I want search results with JavaScript, and second within double quotes say WTF. And look at the kind of number of search results Google shows up. Yes, I, I tried it with about 15 odd languages. Uh, anybody wants to get, guess which was the number one language that came up? 
It's sec- JavaScript was second by the way. PHP. <laughs> but they are closely competing with each other. <laughs> and then to imagine that language is going to be unifying sir, client and server and you know taking away network latency makes me feel ah, uh, you know, scared. But you know, that could happen. I mean, it's getting successful, right? And people are talking about again, you know, uh, people are talking uh, talking about composing networked applications, which is really strange because I, I, I think sometimes people are really getting ahead of uh, you know what's feasible. Composing network based app, sure, I mean you can talk about it. Uh, it's not at that clean, even if you had Node.js. I mean, uh, to me, probably if somebody wanted to do it, Erlang has the best best infrastructure to be able to do that. Nobody's going to be doing it on Erlang, but. Concurrency is going to be an important aspect as we go forward for some of the applications. It's going to be overhyped unnecessarily for many other applications, but that, that's part of the directory. Uh, but yeah, Node, Node.js I imagine will be a big player there, uh, along with a whole number of other stuff, at least in my mind, there's G event and there is Erlang and there's Tornado and there's, I'm sure Rails will, you know, everybody will have this reactor based implementations. Uh, I would imagine the Node momentum. Uh, would would probably carry it only for so long, and eventually, they, you know, these languages will compete with each other. But the unification of a single language uh, on client and server, the fact that it has a monopoly on the client, uh, and the fact that it's you know continued to bounce back at least twice in, in the history, it seems to make me think you know it will keep on bouncing back again and again, and you know going more. Thank you. What about things like coffee screen, Google? Oh yeah, that's an important point I missed. Uh, is I think you talked about uh, you know these being competitors. I actually start you know I'm starting to think you know really uh, actually it's not an original thought. I, I read it. I, I saw it somewhere. So it's not mine. But JavaScript is the bytecode of the web now instead of Java. So you could have Office script and Clojure script and whatever you wanted, but the bytecode that ships over the wire is JavaScript. So that's one way to really do, uh, you know, look at JavaScript and say JavaScript is really the bytecode. Just like Java today, the JVM is now the infrastructure and then you have Scala and Poja and everybody else writing on top of the JVM. Okay. Uh, JavaScript will probably also provide that kind of an ecosystem. Do you think it has better chances of doing that than something like a native client? Something like? Native client. If you look at what Google is trying with Chrome, huh. what they've done is actual bytecode which is sandboxed. Which means that it's bytecode, runs at low level, but it still runs with sandbox. I, I, I think JavaScript is probably a much better lingua franca. Uh, compiled, I mean, uh, unified JavaScript come generated from other languages like CoffeeScript. I think if you want to really take the WTF away out of JavaScript, keep, the, keep it as a bytecode, but uh, you know, make it other. Than. I, I frankly don't know. At this point in time, I don't know how successful Google is going to be with what it's trying to do. Thank you very much. <laughs>